and we're live. Welcome to Hobbies Unplugged. My name is Josh, and I'm here today with Ethan. Um, he is the CEO of Merlin Models and Pendragon Collection. So I want to kind of introduce the concept of why we're doing this and, and what it's all about to begin with. We want to give our audience a chance to get to know us so that they know who they're working with when they buy our products, when they research us. We want to just kind of pull back the veil and show, you know, show everybody what we're about, what we're doing and where we're going. So I'm going to break this into two sections. So at the beginning, I just want to talk about who we are, you know, so that you guys get to know us a little bit better. And then we want to dig a little bit more into our companies. Uh, talk about who they are, where they came from, and what we're doing. And uh, I'll start with myself. So my name's Josh. I work on both Pendragon Collection and Merlin Models. Um, I am primarily our web designer. Um, I do a little bit of work on marketing, and I interact with the community. And then I'll pass it over to Ethan. Hey, guys. So you might have seen me before on some of the Merlin Models videos, but just to let you know who I am for anybody who does not know. I'm the CEO of Merlin 3D Studio. We've got two brands, Merlin Models, which is for custom collectibles in the pop culture industry. And then we have just started our new brand called Pendragon Collection, which is based on original art. So our original luxury collectibles are going to include things from fantasy and World War II and all kinds of different stuff where we're going to try to make the most accurate, most interesting and most different collectibles and model kits that the industry has ever seen. Our first endeavor with Pendragon Collection, however, is going to be our display cases, which you may have seen a little bit about as we've started posting. And that's going to be the primary discussion for today is going over our very first uh, sample and kind of some of the features and what you can expect from the campaign, etc. Exactly. So we'll cover that near the end of the show. Um, we do want to pull back the veil on that and show you some actual um, some actual samples. This is not the final product, so we want to talk about that. Um, this is um, an iteration of it, but it is really close to our final iteration. So we wanted to show you something physical. Um, to cover us a little bit on a personal level, um, just so you know who we are and kind of where we're coming from and, and what we like to do um, personally, um, I am getting into the hobbyist industry, so I have a background in technology in general, um, but I've recently started doing a lot of 3D printing. Um, I'm learning airbrushing, and don't worry, I'm not one of our designers, so you don't have to worry about some amateur working on your stuff. Um, we do have experts for that stuff, but um, uh, we, we actually both recently got Steam Decks. We've been playing through Guild Wars 2, um, got a lot of interest on that front. Um, Ethan, if you want to chip in with any of the stuff that you like to do outside of work, well, I mean, the honest truth is, as most people know from the Merlin model side, I've been working um, on creating our collectibles for that for the most part. But on the side, I've been painting and building model kits and custom things for the past, oh, I'd like to say maybe 20 years. Um, my professional skills started in architecture, doing 3D design for architecture, and we moved into engineering and development for products um, four years ago. And we've been doing that for the past four years. So some of the interests that really help that are very broad interest in 3D printing. Uh, we focus a lot on resin 3D printing here. So that's something that's pretty dear to us because we use it both for fun and for uh, work. You can see behind me that I am a collector. So I collect statues right now i'm collecting one quarter scale and one third scale for the most part but i'm just getting into the one sixth scale and then of course i collect the the things that we make as well so that's something that i really enjoy too yeah and it's kind of funny because um when we were growing up i was the one that had initially was the artist that had a, an interest in that and started going to, to college for that and then you know went off in a different career direction before kind of coming back full circle and you're rejoining the the art industry and the design industry so i'm catching up um but it's been it's been really cool um i do want to shift and talk a little bit about the company itself because what we do at 
Merlin and across the brands at Merlin is kind of special. Um, so for those of you that are following our Pendragon collection website, you might notice that there's a new um, who we are page, you know, an about us page. And I did a little bit of a deep dive into like what makes us different? Like why should you follow us versus somebody else? And uh, one of the examples that I want to use is that when we were discussing like the concept of making display cases and you know why we wanted to even enter the industry, um, one of the things that we did was we started researching um, different Kickstarters that have been done for uh, cases recently. And we noticed a couple things that really stood out. So one was that a lot of the cases that we looked at, um, they had stuff like they had like RGB lights for the cases. They had, you know, string LED lights for the cases. Um, we noticed that if you zoomed in on a lot of the images that you saw quite a few um, 3D print pieces mixed in, you know, like for shelving and brackets and stuff like that. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with 3D printing. We, we use it sometimes, but the, the thing is that for each element of a case or each element of a product, we want to be using the best material for whatever that piece is. You know, we want to be making the best possible choice. And so that really is, is where we're coming from as a company. We want to focus on just the absolute apex of quality that technology allows for. Um, so for those of you that have followed us for a while, you might have saw or, or, or seen us featured on um, the Tested Show with Adam Savage. And one of the things that he pointed out during his show was that the quality of the pieces that we had produced for the model that he was reviewing were just off the charts. And he, he pointed out that um, one of the ways that we accomplished that is that the molds that were used to cast the pieces are only used for a very limited number of times. And that's not normal in our industry. Um, normally, companies will use a mold until it wears out or something like that. And, and you actually see that in the final product. You see a lot of imperfections. Um, you know, that's, that's stuff that doesn't always get caught by quality control. So we really focus on trying to make sure that quality is in every single piece. So that's one of our, our main cornerstones as a company. And then on top of that, we also want to make sure that we are selling things at the right prices. And I know every company says that, but we, we see a lot in our culture that a company tends to price their stuff at whatever the maximum is that the market will support, you know, whatever the consumer allows. And they tend to get away with a lot. You know, we feel like when you look at a product and there's a 500% markup added to the product, that that's just not the way you treat your customers. That's not a customer focused approach to business. So we really want to do this the right way. So you know, obviously as a company, we need to be profitable or, or we don't exist, but we want to be making um, consumer first choices as we design and price the products. Um, I was actually talking with Ethan before the show about, um, you know, there is a, a, a company that we won't name, but they made a huge change to one of their policies that actually very negatively impacted their customers. And when the CEO was uh, interviewed about it by the media, his reasoning behind it was that they had just identified uh, uh, an element that was not monetized properly. Um, and you know, there's differences. You know, we want to be really clear. Like we realize that companies need to have the right strategy. They need to, you know, be successful as a company. So if you're a little company that's getting your feet and you're playing around with what works for you, yeah, obviously you're going to be looking for how you monetize stuff. But if you're a huge mega corporation that's already extremely profitable and you're just looking for those little nitpicky things that you can do to squeeze your consumer that bit more. We don't agree with that. We, we feel like that's exploitation and that's not who we want to be as a company. And we also realize that as consumers, you guys have been kind of conditioned to believe a couple things. So companies have set this precedent that if something costs a whole lot, that that means that it's higher quality. And sometimes that's true, but you'd be surprised how many times it's not. I, I know personally, if I go, you know, shop Amazon for something that, you know, you get the flashiest pictures in the world with the greatest promises in the world. And then more often than not, you actually get the product and it's very disappointing. It doesn't actually add up to what that was supposed to be. And so we want to change that, that uh, dynamic. We want to change the script on how that stuff works. 
So we want to be able to price stuff in a way that's very consumer friendly while not losing. Yeah, you know, we don't want to project to you that because something is priced in a very competitive and fair way that you're getting less quality. Like we're going to deliver more quality for less price. That's really where we're coming from. Uh, do you have anything you want to add to that, Ethan? I think you've covered it really well. Um, I think so. Giving your giving giving a good example is on the Merlin model side since we've been doing that for three years now. You know, he mentioned that the molds get changed out pretty often, but it's not just the molds that we focused in on. It's also the materials. So materials are super, super important if you want something that's actually going to last. So we make sure that we use the absolute best quality casting plastics. And if something's fragile, we switch it over to an even stronger industrial strength plastic. We make sure that we use as much metal parts as we possibly can to make sure that things are not wobbly or bent or um, have a tendency to want to droop. Um, so it's all about very, very specific and conscious engineering. And we're, we use that for Pendragon Collection as well with the display cases that you can see here that we'll talk about, as well as any collectibles that we make and model kits that we make. It's all about what can we do to provide more to you as a consumer and still keep it within a price that is reasonable based upon those materials, not based upon how much profit we want to earn from it. So it's all about material first and engineering first. And then it's based upon what you guys can actually afford. And some luxury models are expensive and that's just, and that's the case, but keeping our profits lower, we would rather have more, more customers, more of you guys than we would take more from fewer people. If that exactly. makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like, like I said before, yeah, I was throwing out that random number of saying, you know, 500% markup. That's not a joke. Um, that's, a, that's how the industry moves, you know, where you take your, your costs, you know, and that's wrapping up everything, like your production costs, your artist costs, your, you know, everything, you know, you have a number that that ultimately costs your money. And then they add the 500% to it. We will never do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's going to we'll, be fair. We'll, we'll talk about that, some specific numbers, uh, when we get to the case, because mm -hmm. there's some very interesting things that we found when we were doing our research um, that we found shocking. And oh, absolutely. You know, we're still going through the process of iteration here. Um, so we don't even have our price set, but we, we know kind of the ballpark of what we can afford to sell it at. And we know what a professional manufacturer that does custom cases for museums, what they charge. And it's, it's astronomically different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is actually probably the appropriate time to maybe talk about the case more. So, you know, we just covered it that as a company, you know, we focus on the materials, the science, the technology, you know, we're, we're putting those things first. And so um, I would say, let's start with, you know, when we decided that we wanted to make a case, you know, that, that, that was an industry that we wanted to enter, um, you know, we, I talked about how we researched, you know, what, what was happening on Kickstarter. You know, we looked at what's already going on in the industry. And then we took a step back and said, okay, we don't want to just, you know, take the general idea of what's already out there and just maybe make it a little bit better. We want to, you know, not copy these other brands that are already in this space. We want to do something different. And so what we ended up settling on was that, you know, when you think about who's the best in the display case industry, it's museums, right? You know, they, they have to protect those products they have to display them and present them in the best way possible you know they're gonna they're the the absolute best at what they do the the tricky thing is that museums buy from very specific manufacturers they buy the, in bulk and even in at, at that bulk rate the price for those tends to be in the multi thousands of dollars and so we looked at that and said okay you know, if you're a consumer and you want to have a case that is like this at this quality level, sure, you might be able to make a deal with one of these providers that works with museums, but you're going to have to be prepared to pay those multi thousands of dollars for each case. So there is not really somebody out there already that is creating something that is museum inspired, that is made with the materials and the science that goes into a museum case and is selling to consumers directly. And that's where we wanted to 
basically step in and meet that need. We see that as a need as we look at how people display things in their homes and how really how important the subject is itself. Because when you think about displaying something, you know, I think we can take our audience and really break it into two groups. So we've got the collector audience, you know, those that are buying pre-made statues and figurines and things like that. And then we've also got the creator audience who, you know, puts together a model and paints it or takes a miniature and paints it and, you know, creates it in some way. And so when you think about displaying those things, you are, you are kind of creating um, a reflection of yourself in some way. You are telling a story about something that's meaningful to you that touches you in a certain way. So when somebody comes into your home or your space or your office or wherever you have it, man cave, um, they are learning something about you. It is reflected back to them from the things that you choose to display in your personal spaces. And so having a way to present those and, and to present them in a way that really highlights the arts, the effort, all that stuff that went into it. Um, that's all stuff that goes into what we're doing, you know, as we come up with these ideas and, and why we're doing them. Um, so Ethan, let's talk about when you were researching the museum cases, what, what elements of those cases really stood out to you that we felt like we had to include? So there were a few very, very specific elements that we did not see in most cases that you could order. Um, everything was kind of a piecemeal setup as far as museum cases went. So if you go to a professional museum case company that makes cases for museums, what you can order usually is going to be um, either a complete custom solution or an off the shelf within the custom market type setup. So off the shelf would be some sort of standard base and uh, a glass top. That's it. That's all you get. That's all you get. Usually that starts at about six or $700 for a case about this big and then just climbs from there. Then you have upgrades to that. One of the upgrades is going to be one of the most important features to us, which is the glass. So most standard glass, as you can see here in this case here is going to be very, very reflective glass. It's clear but it's very reflective. So you can see my room, you can see part of the monitor, you can see all kinds of stuff in that glass. You have the acrylic case that we handmade here with our uh, laser cutter. This was one of the very first iterations of the case. Um, it's a flat pack design. So you've got these brackets that hold the pieces together. It looks decent, but this would be considered on the high end material, low end cost market because you can buy cases that have weird interlocking plastic cutouts and you'll see a lot of that stuff on Facebook. Um, that's the cheap way to go. Now we're using quarter inch material, which none of those cases will do, but you can still see a lot of reflections and you can see these brackets, which is just kind of a little bit unsightly when you're talking about your case. Then you've got what's called anti-reflective glass. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and bring up what that actually means. So anti-reflective glass has a specific chemical coating on it. And that chemical coating takes the reflections instead of bouncing them directly back at you, they take those reflections and they spread them apart, which is a really interesting process. And we're talking about with uh, reflections, we're talking about, really it's about light. It's about reflecting and bouncing off light or how it's diffused. Yeah. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. So you can see this picture. On the left-hand side, you're going to see regular clear glass, and you can see the reflection of the person taking the, the photo. Then you've got two different levels of anti-reflective glass. The middle one is pretty fantastic, and this would be a standard that we could use. We're, we're debating between these two, and this is just gonna be based upon the price that it comes back at. But the middle one has one coating of the anti-reflective chemical material on it. And you can see that the reflections are reduced by about 75%, maybe 80%. Then you have the third version, which has basically zero reflections. So when you're looking at that case, or if that case is in your room, 
you're going to see no reflections of the surrounding area of your space. Like if you've got 20 glass cases in your man cave and you've got your big screen TV or your computer or something like that, in a regular setting, you're going to have reflections of your lights and your TV and all that stuff bouncing off all of that stuff. So if you're sitting down to watch a movie or you want to have friends over and take a tour of your room or whatever, it's going to be much more difficult for them to see inside your case and actually see the object that you're wanting to present. So by putting this glass in, you're actually going to see your objects and not get all those reflections all over the room, which is a really huge deal. So this is one of the primary focuses that we're still working on is getting this glass. On our case here, we are using a optically clear acrylic but it is not anti-reflective. So just be aware when we go over this, it's not gonna be anti-reflective, it's just optically clear. So it looks, it looks great, but it's not what we are after. So we are working on getting that glass changed out and there'll be a video specifically on that. But when it goes to the development of the design, we started off with this design and we were inspired by mid-century modern architecture and like really pulling off a really super modern feel to the case. We put in these little um, white circles that you can see on the right-hand side are for shelves that could be placed in with just pins. Then we used multiple adjustable spotlights to highlight the case. But when we talked to our clients and went over through focus groups and et cetera, they told us that the tunnel effect wasn't something that they were very interested in. And we we agreed with them that unless you're looking at it directly on, it doesn't provide like a large spatial feel for the case itself. We like this because it protects against unwanted reflections from the side and really focuses in on the object. But that development needed to be adjusted to make more sense for the the spaciousness that you were looking for. So we took that design and we started to modify that and we created this next case. You'll see that with this next case, you've got some hardware that's sticking up into the glass area. One of the main features of the case that we also wanted to include wasn't just the anti-reflective glass, but it was also a flat pack shipping design. We wanted to ensure that the cases could be easily assembled and then taken apart so that first off, the shipping cost, <clears throat> when we're actually doing the Kickstarter and it's over and you get your object, the shipping cost of something like this that's completely assembled is gonna be astronomical because you're basically shipping air, but it's the same weight as if it was packed flat. And then if you ever wanted to move or anything where you're wanting to transport your case, it just becomes a huge hassle. So we wanted to make sure that you basically have a top section, a bottom section, a back section, and then the glass sections and all of it just screws together so that the whole thing can be flat packed. It still takes up obviously the same amount of weight, but much less surface area, which means a whole lot less shipping cost. So that was one big adjustment that we made. Then we, of course, we added the 360 degree glass and the curved, we left the curved shape. And people like this one a little bit more, but it still wasn't hitting the mark as far as what people wanted. And I think it's because people are educated based upon the cases that they've seen before and they weren't as open to like a very, very modern style of case. So we took that case, we actually brought that into production for a sample and it became this case. So we hid the hardware, we reduced the roundness of the corners and everything else we kept the same. So this case was actually made as a sample through our vendor. And when we saw it in reality, the round corners just didn't work for a large case. Very interesting. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's one thing that you have to do is, is you have to iterate based upon what you're actually seeing in real life. So we went back to the drawing board, 
and came up with what we think is the best of both worlds with this case. So we exchanged the individual spotlights for one large light box. This provides a much more even diffusion down on your model. Then we reduced the rounded corners to just be very slight, you know, just a slightly rounded corner, just to give it a, a little bit of a modern feel. Then the glass on the sides has a screen printed coating on it. And you've got three massive screws on the top and three massive screws on the bottom with screw covers that hold the sides together. You've got the same for the back. And then the front is magnetized so that you can just pop it off. And then behind that, as you can see here, you've got dimmer switches. And you've got a dimmer switch for your adjustable lights on the floor. And then you've also got a dimmer switch for the top, and they're both controlled down here. This allows you to set the brightness to the exact amount that you want. We had some people also talk about the feet. And they said, you know, I don't want feet. I don't want to have to worry about dusting underneath it and all that kind of stuff. Well, these cases are first off made to be mounted on the wall. So that's one interesting feature that we wanted to make sure was added. So depending upon how much, you know, you can support with anchors, you know, you can put this on the wall. And the feet just unscrew and you can take them off. And then it's nice and flush if you wanted to put it on a flush shelf or they're gone whenever you're going to mount it on the wall. So that was another thing that we wanted to make sure that we added. Now, on the back of the case, there are some very special features. And let's go ahead and we can close this down. So if you look at the back, First, you're going to notice that you've got a, uh, a flexible wire here. To be able to make the flat pack design work, there's no way to get the wires to this light down into the control box hidden in a nice way without you being able to see it from the inside. So we gave ourselves a little bit of space in here. It's kind of a little cubby hole. Um, it's about half an inch thick. And that gives us the space to just run a little DC cable from the down part to the top part. Up here, you've got blocks, and this is where your heavy duty mounting hardware will go. And then down here, you've got two extra ports, and we're going to, we're still working on figuring out exactly where we need to put them. We're probably gonna take uh, one port and move it over here. You've got an in port, which is gonna be your power port. So that supplies power. Then you've also got an out port. So this allows you to first off, daisy chain multiple cases together so that you've got one power source that goes down to the ground. Then you can just connect multiple cases to each other and it's going to give you a lot less cable to have to hide whenever you're designing the way that your display cases are going to be set up. If they're going to go on the wall, you've got to put you know some nice cable covers or something like that. You don't want to have a whole bunch of cable covers going directly down to the ground. So we made it to where you'd only have to worry about one. We're going to end up adding a cutout both on the bottom and the sides so that the cables are nice and flush and this thing can still mount up against the wall. Then the other reason that you want this out port is we're going to include some extra kits, kit parts, as well as a schematic to where you can drill a very small hole in the back of your case and slide a rubber grommet in there. Then that's going to allow you to do a couple of different things. Number one, you can put a turntable in here, which we're designing our own very shallow turntable so that you could actually have your model rotate. You run the power plug out the back of the rubber grommet, plug it into the out port. And now whenever you turn this on, the turntable will start working. Also, if you have models like this Iron Man here who has its own power source so that it can light up, you want a way to be able to still make use of those light up features. So you can also put the rubber grommet in there and plug that in and then your actual model will light up whenever you turn the case on. But some people don't want that. Some people don't need that. So we didn't want to have it as a standard feature to have a rubber grommet back there that looks unsightly dependent upon the situation. So it's just a very small hole to drill. Again, it's super easy to do. Anybody can do it. And then you just pop the rubber grommet in. But it's not a permanent feature so that we can still keep that nice, clean look. So with this front face, you can see you've got these magnets here, which are hidden by your front face. Again, this is not anti-reflective glass. You can see that it is reflecting, very reflecting, but it is very clear. And all you gotta do, 
is pop your face on and that's it. And if you want to take it off, you just grab the edge and pop it off nice and strong. So we're going to re get we're getting replacements of these pieces of glass. This is acrylic and we're going to get re replaced with actual anti-reflective glass because they just cannot get the chemical coating to work correctly with acrylic for some reason. Down here, you've got your two dimmer switches. And if we grab our power source and we plug it in, then very easily you can light up your case and it can get pretty bright. Sorry, my camera really sucks. Um, <laughs> so you can dim that down. And then you've got your two spotlights here, which are also, also dimmable. Now, talking about lights, lights are not made equal. So lighting is another thing that was very important to us. If you look on the website, you're going to see some really interesting pictures of how the lighting actually works. Um, let me go ahead and pull up a picture for you. Right. And something uh, worth mentioning real quick is like, as he talks about this science, remember that almost every other case on the market right now, you know, and this is what we found as we researched and just kind of looked into what people are doing. Um, quite a few of the cases don't have lights at all. Um, the rest of them, you remember, we're talking like standard LED strip lights. We're talking about RGB random stuff, which doesn't even make sense. So yeah, keep yeah, in I mind mean, that this is what's on the market compared to what we're doing. And then I'll, I'll flip it back to you. And I think, I think some of it has to do with, again, people are educated based upon the lighting that they see. So your standard bulb that you're going to get from Home Depot or your, your hardware store is not a professional light. You're not going to see a professional light unless you go to a museum. But we're educated to think that we're seeing color in a certain way. And the reality is, is that color is not the way that it could be. So if you look at this picture, this is what a standard LED bulb will present to you. The colors are not incredibly vibrant. What they, what they use as a metric for this is called CRI. And CRI is a metric of 0 to 100 with natural like sun daylight. If you go outside, that's a 100. And then most LEDs that you buy off of Amazon or something like that, are going to be at a CRI of somewhere around 60 to 80, 70 percent, something like that. It's a it's a very low number. Now, if you get a professional LED light, that professional LED light is somewhere over 90 on the scale of one to 100. Um, what we like to use is something around 95, and that gives you the actual reproduction of the color. And it's and we found that that's super important. It's worth the extra cost to put the right light in the case so that the colors of your statues and your model kits and your miniatures actually look the way that they're supposed to look. So both of these both of these lights here are high CRI at 95%. Now these spotlights are adjustable and we're still looking for the absolute best solution for this, but you can adjust them back and forth which is really cool. And then this one, both both of these are color matched. So we're using a higher temperature um, lighting to be able to present the colors accurately as if as, as they should be. So uh, daylight is 6,500K on a temperature scale. Um, your average light bulb is around 3,200K. So it's a, it's a much more warm color, but that warm color tints what you're looking at. So we like to use a neutral color. So we're using 6,500K here so that the lighting is 100% neutral and you're going to see exactly what you're supposed to see. Then we made sure that the bottom of the case was a neutral gray, 50-50% gray. So this is super important because what this is, allows it to do is create a very soft diffusion that's going to reflect back a little bit and kind of uplight uh, your figure just a little bit more than just these spotlights. So that's the basic sense of the case. We're going to do another video um, where I take this whole thing apart and put it together so as you can see the process of actually building the case. And then I think over the next two weeks, um, hopefully not, not longer than two weeks, we will get our new glass in and then, you, then we'll do a really cool comparison between a standard glass and the real 
anti-reflective glass. But this case without lighting and without glass would cost over $650 with a um, museum quality manufacturer. And that would not include a black top. It would literally just be a gray bottom, a wooden base, no feet, no no features whatsoever, just just glass and and a black base. If you add clarity to the glass, not anti-reflective, but just clarity, it jumps up to a thousand. If you added all of this stuff, this case would be, I don't know, it could be twelve, thirteen, fifteen hundred dollars from a museum company. Like that's that's insane. And most of them still like just getting quarter inch material versus eighth inch material is another huge deal. Like if you go on to, I don't know, whatever random, uh, just kind of like, you know, display case for baseballs and whatever manufacturer that you can get custom sized. Right. Yeah. Look on Kickstarter, look on yeah, yeah. Alibaba, Amazon. So they've got, they've got two options. One is they'll, they will glue a case together. Okay. So usually what they'll do is they'll take a piece of material that goes all the way up and down and they will bend it. So you'll have a rounded, you'll have a rounded edge here because this is all one piece and then they'll glue the sides in and you'll be able to see that glue and it's going to be an eighth of an inch thick, three millimeters thick, super, super thin. Uh, it's fine. It doesn't look great. It's not even using optical glass. It's using just cheapo, um, what they call crystal clear acrylic, which is just general purpose acrylic. So the first step is doubling the thickness of the glass because that makes a much more professional, much more sturdy case. Next is get rid of the bending where they're just melting the case into a shape. Make sure that you've got nice square edges. You can get um, what might be considered even worse. Um, they have cases that are all cut out to where they just interlock together. So your the corners of your case are going to look like that. I mean, that's that's pretty hideous, you know, and it's still going to be eighth of an inch. So those two are the only options that are available to consumers. Nobody nobody makes anything that's professional with like seamless edges and stuff. So if you look at this, this is going to be very reflective. So bear that in mind. But look at that edge. You know, that is a clean, clean edge. You know, so that's super, super important is that it looks professional. It acts professional and it can support the weight. So we will do a test on video of supporting weight. We're going to buy weights and we'll put them on here just so that you can see how much weight this will hold. But just this one itself can probably hold at least 50 pounds. So whatever you wanted to put in here, nothing's going to happen. And we're going to make sure that there's a um, supported grid structure for each of these because we have different sizes and they get bigger. There's a grid structure that is, it has a specific distance. So we know that that's how much weight can be supported by, you know, a however many square inches and that grid structure will get repeated depending upon the size of the case so that regardless of what you put in here if you get a big case that's 32 inches long you can still line that up with heavy figures because that grid structure is repeated so very strong but these two pieces are extremely light because we're making them out of acrylic thick acrylic but it's still acrylic these are eventually going to end up being glass is what we're thinking so that's going to weigh more but it's going to be like incredibly professional so we're really excited to be able to show that to you guys and we will as soon as physically possible yeah absolutely um two more points on the case or on the glass really so he talked about the transparency but there there are two more things that are worth noting um one is that the he, like he mentioned clarity is at 99 percent. like this is as transparent as you can get glass to be and then the second point is that it, it also blocks uv light so that point's actually really important because some materials, especially if they're exposed to sunlight, like near a window or something like that, they will yellow over time. So depending on what your model is made out of, you know, what you built it out of, that's a concern with other cases. Um, that's not going to happen with ours. So yeah. we've got, I mean, we you can tell how thoughtful the process has been, um, the the attention to detail that we're we're doing. Um, I do want to address a couple things that were brought up in our various communities. Um, so we had somebody ask last week if we plan on offering the cases in additional colors. So I think at the point at this moment, the answer is fairly obvious um, with all that he just talked about, you know, with why we chose the colors, why the gray on the floor is important. Uh, so right now we don't have plans to do additional colors. 
Um, and it's not because we don't want to be flexible. It's because the science really says that this is the way to go. Um, we also, you know, strangely enough, had somebody who's like, hey, these are fake. You guys are just, you know, whatever. Um, obviously not. We wanted to show you um, one of our iterations. You know, we've we've been working with physical product for a while now. And like he said, this is really kind of the final design other than the glass, you know, we're, we're, we have a final design that's going to have the final version of the glass, um, but this is kind of it. And then we have this, um, something to point out is that we have this in a bunch of sizes. So we've got a bigger size that he's showing right now, but we also wanted to really pay attention to the, the miniatures community. We wanted to make sure that we had a couple different case configurations that would really be ideal for board game miniatures, for just smaller figurines or action figures, or even Hot Wheels if you wanted to. Um, so we've got this case in every real configuration that a hobbyist community could want it to be in. Yeah, he's showing one on the screen right now. Yeah, so this so, is a 12 by 12, and you yep. can see that it's just going to have a single dimmer. The way that these are created is that they come fully assembled. So the, there's a glass front that goes on top, and then there's enough shelves to where the split between the shelves is 100 millimeters. So if we just cycle through here, this is a 12 inches wide by 24 inches tall. Then this is 24 inches wide by 12 inches tall. And then this is 24 by 24. And you can see that all of that is fully adjustable as far as the shelves. The shelves are included, all of that good stuff. So these are specifically made to go on the wall. The round design actually works really well with these. So that way we get that nice modern look. And these are made for board game miniatures, Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games miniatures, uh, figure painters and busts and stuff like that. You can fit your Hasbro collectibles in here, all your Black Series action figures. You can fit your Hot Wheels collection of, of cars. Um, I mean, you name it, any of those. All right, I think we're having a little technical difficulty. He'll be back in a second. But... Yeah, like you said, any of those things will fit in the cases. They're really built for it. They're they're meant to hold them, and it's it's going to be fantastic. All right, I think we're back. Yeah, yeah, we're back. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, I know we were. We had um we had some technical difficulties this morning. Had a little camera catastrophe. Like he said, he's using one that we didn't plan to originally use, and that won't be the the main camera moving forward. And uh, the the replacement camera likes to um get warm and then turn off for a moment <laughs> but this won't be our normal <laughs> our norm moving forward um but we can talk about what we will be doing moving forward so our podcast is going to be a regular thing um we're talking about doing it bi-weekly at the moment and the format that we want to use is that we we want to from our perspective as a manufacturer and from our perspective of prioritizing quality we want to provide commentary on things within the, the hobbyist and collecting spaces. So we're going to you know, come up with a few topics per episode. We do want to give you updates about our projects as part of what we do, but we don't want to just be completely self-focused with these shows either. Um, we want to be able to take our expertise that we have in these different areas and provide insight into things that will matter to you. So that's going to be the ongoing format of our podcast, and you can expect a lot from that. Um, additionally, we want to make a request of the community. So like we talked about, we're not completely a brand new brand. So the, the Merlin 3D Studios parent company has been around for a long time, but the Pendragon collection brand itself is brand new. It is, it is getting established right now. And as such, we want to, we want to ask you as a community to help us with that a little bit. So we talked a little bit earlier about our approach as a company, you know, how we want to exceed the quality that you're expecting while keeping that price very reasonable and fair. So we're doing we're doing something that the industry just does not do right now. We're we're breaking the norms, you know, breaking new ground with what we're doing as a brand. And so what's going to allow this brand to succeed and grow is exposure. You know, we need this brand to be seen because, it, again, we're not going to try to sell to you know a small group of people for our, a huge markup. We want to sell to a lot of people for as little of a markup as we can handle. Mm -hmm. So for that, we really need you guys to help. So um, 
on our website. If you go to pendragoncollection.com, you'll see links to our social media. Please follow us on each one. Um, if you see us post, feel free to um, to retweet or to share our posts. You know, spread that out throughout your own communities. We want other people to be part of what we're doing as well. Yeah, and, and just to reiterate on um, on the pricing point, because we we should have probably mentioned that a little bit earlier, uh, we do not have pricing nailed down because again, we're still working with some new glass vendors on the anti-reflective glass. But just for an example, we talked about how this price could this case could cost about twelve hundred dollars from a museum. Uh, company, we are shooting for three hundred dollars retail for this, and two hundred and fifty dollars on Kickstarter. So just to let you guys know, that's what we're shooting for. Now it could it could go up. It also could go down, depending upon what we're, what deal we can work out with with the glass company. But you can just see that that's twenty five percent of the cost of getting the same thing from a museum company. That's how much they mark stuff up because of the the corporateness of the system so we could sell it for more but we would rather have more people with our cases you know absolutely that's what it boils down to yep and so like you said the price is not locked in but what is locked in is that we're not going to be doing a markup like that so the only yeah. variable is just what are the materials actually going to cost us in the end um we will share that as soon as we do have that locked down and then you know something to uh, kind of highlight a little bit too is that we will be releasing these first on kickstarter so we want to give our core community an opportunity to buy these before they go out to the general public on retail. So if you are interested in what we've shown you and what we're doing, um, we would encourage you again, follow us on those social media platforms. We will be making our Kickstarter announcements in all of those places, as well as on our website. Um, the pendragoncollection.com website is also a great resource for more information about the technology and the science that goes into these cases. So if you want to sit down and you know, digest that in a written form, that's a great place to go. And uh, I think we are officially hitting the end of our time for the first episode. Yeah. So, so hopefully you like what you see. Um, you know, we're really excited. We truly are. Um, as you can tell, this is something that's just not being done in the consumer space. And you know, this is also not our only project. We have a lot of other projects that are in development. So there will be a lot more coming from Pendragon Collection. Yeah, be sure to let us know in the comments things that you would like us to talk about. You know, Absolutely. for example, maybe not a lot of people have seen the the J and D silicone statues. Do you want us to do a, a specific headliner on that and talk about that stuff? Do you want to talk about sideshow? Do you want to talk about hot toys? Um, do you want to talk about specific um, model kit brands in the industry? You know, all that kind of stuff. We're we're we want to talk about. Anything like that, as as well as you know, important news that happens every week or every two weeks, you know, within the grand industry of statues and collectibles and, and model making. Definitely. So. All right. Thank guys. Well, yeah, absolutely. Until next time, um, I'm Josh and he's Ethan, and uh, we'll be back with episode two very soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.